Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. A painting can give a feeling of place and mood that a photograph cannot do. We have a connectedness between all of us, and that connectedness can be brought forth in a painting. With a landscape painting, it is that connection to the land and how we feel about a place and what that place reflects back to us in terms of our own lives. And this land is so compelling and so enduring that I have to paint it. We have unique resources here, and these natural resources are very rare. Many areas here have been so altered that there aren't very many spots left that hold these special plant and animal communities. There will come a time where there will only be a few of these spots left. The more habitat we can protect, the better wildlife and fisheries and natural resources are going to be for our quality of life as a nation, as a people. Art has the ability of changing people's perspectives, opening their eyes in a way that they haven't seen the landscape before. That's why I turn my attention to the Blufflands, to the Driftless region, to help people see and understand this special area. One can learn that the land and the plants that grow on it have stories. And those stories can help you recognize what has happened to that land. Like invasive plants will come into an area that's been disturbed. And native plants will grow in places where the land has not been disturbed. Or there might be a combination that tells another history. So knowing something about ecology and botany has given me the opportunity to see the land in a way that I never saw it before. Well, I'm Sarah Lubinsky. I have had a great opportunity in my life to do a couple careers, one of them as an artist, which I do full time now, and the other for over 25 years as a botanist with the federal government. And those two careers kept me in places I wanted to be. I want to be outside and enjoying nature. As a botanist, I worked along the Mississippi River doing research on aquatic plants for about 10 years. And that opportunity gave me insight into how the river helps migratory waterfowl live and all life that needs the river environment. And later I went to work with a team of people that were mapping the vegetation communities in national parks. I have always been interested in plant geography how plants transport themselves from place to place, what their ecological habitats are. So I worked from the coast of Maine to northwest Montana and down south into Arkansas. For example, we worked in Glacier, which is over a million acres, so you can imagine how many field trips we had to make to that park to figure out what we were seeing on those aerial photos. Another favorite place besides Glacier that I worked was Acadia National Park on the coast of Maine. So I got a whole nother perspective. Um, travels to an island called Isla Ho where I slept on the floor of a cabin and spent the days tromping in bogs and along rocky coasts. It was just really exciting. But it was during the times when I was traveling to these incredible places that I found 
working with other scientists that my mind would be going off in this little direction that would talk to myself about how beautiful the sky was or what color would I paint those mountains or some other aspect that wasn't really related to the subject at hand. And so I would drift off a little bit <laughs> in those conversations and when I was trying to draw those lines I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, I remember how beautiful it was there and how incredibly stunning those twisted trees could be and the forces that affected them to be like that. I loved the ecology part of it. I just didn't want to have to draw the line. We tend to box things up. And every time you make a map of the vegetation, you're boxing things up. And nature doesn't work that way. It works on a continuum. And I think one of the hardest parts for me uh, in actually doing the mapping was having to draw that line along that continuum because I so well understood that it wasn't this or that, it was this uh, blending of the two. And I realized because of my art background and my rather deep dream of wanting to be a landscape painter that that dream was starting to resurface. And so I decided that I needed to start painting again if I were really going to be the painter that I wanted to be. For a while, I thought I wanted to paint in other places other than the region where I live, partly because I was working in these stunning environments and they overpowered my perspective. But I would come back home and realize that this area, the Mississippi River Blufflands, the Driftless area, has its own beauty and its own mystique. And as I learned more about the area and the fact that I live here made me decide that it would be really wonderful if I could show what this region was like through the eyes of a painter. We have a very rugged topography in this particular region along the river called the Driftless Area. And it's because the last glacier lobe didn't flatten it like it did the surrounding area. So we do have this steep topography with these little narrow valleys and high bluffs and trout streams that run into the river and then of course the river. And it creates a very interesting environment in terms of habitat and for a botanist it's a great place because there's things that grow here that don't grow anywhere else in the world. And so I decided that I needed to paint my home and explore and get to know the area a little bit more deeply. When I started to do this project, I had a focus, and that focus was to record and paint the natural communities that we have. And those natural communities as they relate to uh, conserved landscapes. And so I started creating spreadsheets of the habitats that we have, you know, trout streams and tributaries, or blufflum prairies and oak savannas, or Mississippi River vistas. And then once I had those groups etched out on my spreadsheet, I started tracking where could I find those places. The Driftless region is an area of more than 24,000 square miles, covering portions of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois. That's a lot of area to explore. I decided to reach out to the people who knew it best, the landowners within the Driftless region. How many acres do you have? There's 184 acres. 184, so it starts up at the road and goes back this way? Yeah, it's kind of... It's I hadn't met cool. Ken until this project. He's a very energetic guy that has just this incredible passion for the land. He invited us to come in and sit down around his kitchen table and talk about the property. I grew up on the Upper Miss hunting and fishing and took it for granted. I mean, I, from my perspective, it was public land. And I, and I took it for granted for 50 years and, and never realized how fortunate we were to have all of this public land. For duck hunting mostly. For duck hunting and fishing mm -hmm. and water skiing and all, you know, and, and the fact that all of this... Ken is referring to the Upper Mississippi River National Wildlife and Fish Refuge, which includes the Driftless region and stretches 261 miles to the south. The refuge was established in 1924 to preserve the wild habitat of the river. And knowing that story and learning that story and beginning to appreciate how, how fortunate we are to have that, I started looking at 
my own property and in ways that said, hey, you know, maybe I should be doing some preservation things myself. And then it was like a, an epiphany. I don't have to farm this. I, there's no law that says I do. So we sold the cattle, and um, and then I put some of it in CRP, a good portion of it in CRP, and planted trees. Um, I thought that would be a good way to go. And, and, and it was on farmland that I knew I wouldn't probably ever want to farm again. There was no... I couldn't find a downside. Hmm. The, the only thing that... Ken reminded me of a saying that I'd heard many years ago, and it's one that I think runs through every landowner, but Ken said, we are not the owners of the land, we borrow it from our children. Ken's guidance, along with the other landowners that I've met, really led me to discover some breathtaking areas even a longtime resident like me was unaware of. It seems like every corner that you turn in the Driftless area, there's something new to find. So I set my heart to painting. I found a mentor advocating a way of working that really dates back to the 19th century and people who were influenced by Thoreau and Emerson and were very thoughtful and contemplative about what they painted. And the method that I have learned from her was one that I basically started when I started River Sojourn. And that method involved going out into the field and just sitting and observing and letting your mind just be free to experience the nature around you. And after sitting in a place for a while, I would take out my sketchbook and, and start drawing. And what I learned was that sitting still for a while created an opportunity to see things a little bit differently than had I just gone there right away and set up to paint or to draw. And that stillness, that patience that comes from doing that has been an opportunity to learn things and to know things and to see things much more deeply than I had ever before. And this was a little bit of a surprise to me because I thought I was a pretty good naturalist. But what I started picking up on was the whole forest started realizing that there was something here. And these little birds started coming around me and making their little alarm calls. And after a while, everybody just kind of settled down and it's almost like they accepted me being there. It made me feel like I had seen something special, that I would not have been able to share this experience with these critters had I been walking or talking or with other people or even moving around too much. And it made me feel connected in a way that I had not felt connected, truly connected before. I'll do drawings in the field, and what I've learned to do is small drawings that help me understand the compositional patterns. I'll also do sketches of the elements that I want to include in my drawing, and sometimes even more detailed drawings of the plants and features. When I come back from the field with my sketchbooks, I often do a small study, and the small study gives me an opportunity to work out things like color harmony, the mood that I want, sometimes I change the time of day, and I can make those decisions with that study, and from the study, I'll often paint a bigger painting. And the bigger paintings are more time consuming, so it's nice to have a study that has all of those issues worked out. And I paint in a style that dates back to the Renaissance. I paint in what's called an indirect style in that I do layers of thin paints. So I'll do an underpainting that helps map out the various elements. And then over that, I'll start applying rich texture and colors. It's a very enjoyable process because I get to leave a painting sit on the easel or sit behind the easel for a day or two and then I can bring it out and, and again look at it with fresh eyes.
So I think the botany and ecology part gets me to the habitats I want to go to and helps me recognize the level of natural communities or disturbance and helps me choose where I want to paint. But once I'm there, the art part tends to take over. I start looking at patterns and colors and shapes. I tend to want to paint the integrity of a place and include the tree species that actually grow there. And if I'm doing a foreground with plant species in the foreground, even if I'm just indicating the layer of plants that are there, I want them to be representative of what is actually there. So there's an integrity in my painting that comes from my knowledge of botany and ecology. So being alone in the woods has been one of my greatest experiences. And initially, I used to be a little bit scary. I thought, what am I going to see out here? And I'm all alone. And what if I fall? And all those other things. And I got to just love it, just totally love it. What I've attempted to do is to keep my mind open to new possibilities and to let the forest tell me what to look at. And after a while, I would see things differently. I would see things that I hadn't noticed, and I would see things that I was surprised that I had never noticed before. Different patterns or different species or different color in the light in the sky, just all sorts of things that made me feel like there's this whole different level of awareness that can be achieved if you take the time to do it. There's a sort of melding of a person with the land where you feel like you're dissolving a little bit into the landscape and that sounds really strange but you lose you lose yourself in it it comes back to you in really good ways it makes you love the place and loving the place is i think a big step into um, wanting to protect it Something that I've seen with all the landowners is their perspective of looking beyond their immediate life and what they want the land to be in the future for their children or for anybody else that might live there. And there's been this you know, running theme through every landowner that I've, I've met about um, one needs to be a caretaker of the land and not a taker. George Howe lives on a bluff above the Mississippi River, and his family has had that property for several generations. We talked about his perspective on conservation. We talked about his goals for the land in the future. One of the things we see is that the land really affects people. It's enchanting. I've fallen in love with this land and all the beauty of nature here. So your grandfather lived here first, and then your father stayed here, mm -hmm. and now you. And then me, and now I'm raising my children here. Gosh. Who, uh, who in the family decided to make it into a conservation easement, and when was that done? Well, it was first my parents, uh, back when I was a young man, and thinking about moving up here and raising kids. Uh, we saw things going on around us, uh, neighboring properties uh, that were being developed or mined, or uh, the, the woods was being clear cut, um, or excavation was going on, you know, logging roads bulldozed in, that really changed things forever. And we wanted to make sure that those things never happened here, that, the, that there was a plan uh, for the land and nature here to be the top priority. George, what, what is a conservation easement? Well, a conservation easement is the technical legal term, but it's really just a, a conservation plan or an agreement that the landowner creates with the land trust or conservancy. It includes some basic restrictions that will stay with the deed of the land forever, no matter who owns it, the land. They may not want the land to ever be subdivided and developed. They may not want the forest to be clear cut or natural waterways to be altered. We love the land and, and the resources here and nature. And uh, when you've been given so much uh, by land and nature, it's just natural to want to give back. And 
That was probably the most significant thing that we could do as a family is make a commitment and protect the land forever. We know we want clean water. We know that we want habitat that's protected. We know that one of the things that we cherish is the beautiful rural landscape. Uh, statewide, I think there's about 75% of the landscape is in private ownership. The Blufflands is even higher. That's about 90% in private ownership. So if we want to meet any of our goals for habitat conservation, for clean water, we have to work with private landowners to meet those goals. We have uh, landowners right now that, that seem to still be very connected to the land, and they have this land ethic that they want to make sure they transfer on to the next generation. One of the best ways to do that is by protecting your own property. I went to Red Wing because I found out that Henry David Thoreau actually journeyed up the Mississippi River. Uh, it was his very last journey of his life. He traveled from Concord, Massachusetts to Minnesota for his health. The doctor sent him to Minnesota for the dry, clean air. He had TB and he died the following year. Well, Henry David's been an inspiration to me for decades, not only through Walden, but through his influence on a group of painters that I aspire to that painted in the late 19th century. They were huge Throw fans. So I've been getting into Throw a little bit deeper and deeper. And then here, I found out that he had been to Barn Bluff. And when he got to Barn Bluff, he hiked up there and he made a list of the plant species. Here's a species list from 1850 or so. And I also have the new species list collected by one of the DNR people so I can compare what he found and what's now there, which was really exciting to me as a botanist. But the other thing was just to walk in his footsteps and to think that he had been botanizing, you know, with his old manual Gray's botany book under his arm, sticking plants probably between the leaves. And here I was walking in the same place. It just gave me a big thrill because I'm such a big fan of his. So Barn Bluff has become an important part of my river sojourn. This land is a wonderful place. It's been occupied by humans for at least 13,000 years. We have archeological sites here that are particularly predominant at 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and 1,000 years ago. There seems to be periods of time when people are more numerous than others. We see that there were Jim Thaler is a retired university professor. He's an archeologist, and his land has a beautiful oak savanna that was overgrown and that he and his partners, Suzanne, have restored back to being what it should be. Did you spend several seasons? He's a scientist through and through, and one of the most knowledgeable and interesting people. So working on his land gave me um, new perspectives, new knowledge, and I would go home just, just enthralled with what I had learned for the day. We find lots and lots of, of what one would call hunting camps, seasonal camps. Uh, rock shelters in particular have uh, signatures for winter occupations. We sometimes find raw materials that are very distinct and we find pieces of that and you know somebody sat there and made a tool and you might find that tool and you might find a, the flakes or chips from making that tool and you just wish you could go back and see it for a day. You know they sat right there and looked over the same vista that you looked at and they camped there and they looked at the same stars you can see at night. I wanted to go back to the Oak Savannah and visit that rock shelter by myself and sit in that shelter for a long time. And I followed through with my methodology of sitting still and then eventually drawing. And I looked up at the roof and thought about the people that had also stayed in that rock shelter. And when I was there, you cannot help but have this incredible feeling of um, generations that have passed before you and these peoples who lived there and lived such a different life and such a hard life. I think it's almost like this place is full of their spirits. It just pervades the place and it puts 
my day in perspective, to think that the land has always been here, yet we pass through it. And I'm just another generation passing through it and that this rock is giving me protection as it has to others for thousands of years. It's just unbelievable to think about that to me. I see the science and then I do the art and I think about the past and sometimes I think I even span further out in terms of spatial scale. Sometimes I think of me standing in this rock shelter and then I go back and back as if a camera were pulling back further and further. And pretty soon we're just this little dot in this incredible galaxy. And all I can think about is how incredible it all is and how lucky we are to have this gift of life. It's amazing. I have focused the last year and a half entirely on River Sojourn. And it's a choice that I was um, fortunate to be able to make, and one that has brought me incredible adventures in the field and new things to paint and to learn to love and to explore. It celebrates nature, but I'm also hoping that it brings awareness or, or reminds people of what's of value here. And I want to um, just remind people of why they live here, why they love it, um, build awareness for the work that the Conservation Land Trust do. For everybody, there's a message, depending on where they're coming from, what their background is. And the message will be to think about the land and their relationship to it. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.